Well, this morning, you will definitely need an outline. Those of you who have already opened your bulletin, you already see that. If you don't have one, just lift your hand, and these kind folks will be glad to give you one. You need it. I encourage you very much. This morning, indeed, it is a four-pager. That doesn't necessarily mean longer. That simply means that there's a lot of great content here that we want to be able to see. And part of the reason that we do the outline is so that you can go back and see and listen to what God's Word is saying to us as a church and what God's Word is saying to you. I want you to see these concepts. I want you to see His Scripture. And so in our church, we make it very easy for you to be able to see what God's Word says by printing this and being able to go back to it during the week. And I pray that you will do that. Um, If you're clicking in online, I want you to know that you can click down below this message and the outline is there where you can download it and be able to print it out and be able to follow along and pray over these things as we preach along. This morning we come to a great challenge from the Word of God concerning the importance of our families, concerning the importance of the family that God has designed and that God has given us in this earthly life. And I want to, for you to notice two key words in this title. Notice the title. It says, fight for an awesome family. We want to fight for an awesome family. Now, I have chosen the word fight because I believe that that is what we're in. We're in a fight. You see, the picture is that God has designed family from the very beginning in order to show his goodness and to show his grace. Satan hates his goodness. Satan hates his grace. And so Satan rages against the family. Now, there's many things that we could talk about in that regard. We could talk all about cultural societal issues this morning. We could outline all the ways in which the culture is attacking the family. That's not really what we need to do so much as we need to look at what we are called to be as families in the role of God's children. And so we do come to this idea of fight, but not only the idea of fight, but the idea that God, as He is awesome, He has designed our families to be awesome, to be a picture of His power, to be a picture of His grace, to be a picture of His goodness. Now, I know that many of us maybe have have been through things that there weren't so much goodness, grace, and power in our families. I know that there's been many of us that we look back, and and myself included. I mean, my mom and dad were great Christian folk, or are great Christian folks, but they're not perfect. I just want to say to you this morning that there are no perfect families. Even the most awesome family in a fallen world, though saved by God's grace, is not perfect. It still needs the grace of God continually. But I want you to notice here in these passage, in this passage, in Nehemiah chapter 4, we just take a snapshot for a second to see a physical fight that Israel was in, and I just want to relate it a little bit similar to the spiritual fight that we are in in this day and time. But notice that the nation of Israel had gone back to Jerusalem after it had been destroyed, the walls had been torn down around Jerusalem, and God calls Nehemiah to go back and to lead the rebuilding of the wall and the reestablishment of God's city, of the, na- of the city of Jerusalem. And so, when the enemies of Israel found out that they were going back and reconstructing the walls that they had torn down, they all got together. And this story is in Nehemiah chapter 4. You can see that. They were angry that the Israelites were going back to rebuild their wall and rebuild their city. And so they came as if to attack, and Nehemiah had the job of not only seeking to rebuild the wall, but had to protect the project. And so this is part of that picture of him saying, we have to stand and fight. And notice the way that the family fits into this fight that Israel was in. Notice in Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 14, it says, And I looked and arose and said to the nobles and to the officials and to the rest of the people, Do not be afraid of them. Remember the Lord 
who is great and awesome. And look what it says. Let's read this out loud together. And fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives, and your homes. Didn't know that was in there quite like that, did you? There was a physical fight that had to be engaged in. There was a physical fight that the people had to be called to be aware of and be ready to, to wage battle. And so now, if that was ever true in a symbolic sense of things to come, we now see that we, as the people of God, are centered around the gospel of Christ. This is the glorious city that God has rebuilt in Jesus Christ. And we are called to recognize that the battle is real. And so I want to challenge you, whatever age you are, ever how young you are to listening to this message today, because young people, you can apply exactly what I'm preaching this morning right now in your life. This isn't someday. There's much of what I preach this morning that you as youth, junior high and high school and even elementary age in this room, you can come alongside your mom and dad. You can put these words into practice in many ways. And if you're not yet married, which I hope you're not if you're in middle school, I want to encourage you, you can start to say, okay, Lord, what he's talking about right now, help me to be able to do that someday, right? Help me to be able to love my wife someday, or help me to be able to love my husband someday, just like we're seeing here. So that's how you work through this message. Some of you, you say, my kids are gone. I have grandchildren. And there were some things that maybe went well. There were some things that went horribly. Whatever it is, I want to encourage you. And there's, there's some real redeeming grace in this. Um, kind of wherever we are. Because listen, just this week, I had a conversation with somebody about how um, there were things that Marcy and I messed up on with Cheryl Ann and Andrea. There were things that we just, we should have paid more attention to. There were things that we look back and I, I wish I could hit rewind and go back and redo it. But you know, we don't have that luxury, but we do have a God of grace and we do have a God of grace who comes and still works when our circumstances right where we are. And so that's where we find ourselves. So this morning as we look at this, I want you to just, we're going to run fast now. I'm about to speed up. So warm up your pen, get it ready. And here we go. Four common traits of awesome families. You see, awesome families are families that are like God, under the grace of God. Now, your family will either be average or your family will be awesome. It'll either be average or it will be awesome. Now, above the word average, I want you to write the, the thing there, or just right above there, not good. So not below it, but above it, where there's just open space, not good. And what I mean by that is this. The average family in this day and time is not good. The average family in this day and time is increasingly dealing with all kinds of debilitating and dysfunctional issues. The average family is headed more and more likely toward divorce. The average family is headed more and more likely toward uh, various types of neuroses and psychoses that in part come out of what's happening in the family. There are more and more in elements of dysfunction in the American family just this week. Now, somehow, I don't know how it all happened, but somehow I didn't renew the registration on one of my cars, right? Have you ever done that before? I know, I'm the only one. So, <laughs> state trooper pulled me over, said, you didn't renew the registration on your car, you're getting a ticket. So, he wrote me a ticket. This week, I went down to the Broward County Courthouse. That's such a joyful thing to do. <laughs> And I sat in one of those big rooms with lots of people just to prove that I had now paid it. And while I sat in there, I heard family after family after family in utter dysfunction. I could not describe for you one of the conversations that I heard between a mother and a daughter, a mother in her 50s and a daughter in her 20s. It was the most dysfunctional, sad, selfish, angry conversation that, that was revealing what goes on in their home constantly. And I was, I was so saddened by that. And I just began to pray for them. 
I did, they were angry. They were really angry. They were angry with the, they were angry with everything. And I just thought, wow, here I am about to preach on the family, and I get a front row seat to the average disaster that is going on in many, many of our homes. You see, the average family, not good, you've written above, is on accident. The average family is on accident. You see, that if you don't do anything purposefully, you'll have an average family. But the awesome family is on purpose. The awesome family only happens intentionally. And so we want to look and we want to see how can we do this. Now, the first one we come to is awesome. Excuse me, I've already said that word. The first one we come to is a wonderful point that's a clear trait of families that, and this is going to surprise you, but when you look at what are the elements, what are the traits of an awesome family, the first one is going to surprise you. Awesome families are playful. Awesome families are playful. What do we mean by that? Awesome families, fill it in. These families enjoy life. They enjoy life together. You see, average families, just below that, are all work or skill development. There's a lot of families, or you could put in there, or no work and no development. Um, either way, but the average American family does work, and it does work very hard. And very often, we, you know, the rest of the world kind of looks at us and like, you guys, are, you guys are a little extreme on this. You work lots of hours, you work very hard, you put everything into it. Now, work is good to a point, but when work is, is that which drives your life, that is not what God intends. And we're going to see some passages here that show us that God is saying that there's more to life than work. There's more to life than your status. There's more to life than the things that work in itself brings. Look at the next bullet point there. Average, excuse me, awesome families know how to have fun. That being very similar. They know how to have fun. They've, they've been working on it. They've been figuring it out. Average families are too busy and too tired. Day goes into day from long and stressful hours, the next client, the next job opportunity, the next, the next uh, overtime, the next thing that continually pulls away. And you say, well, wait a minute, I'm trying to provide. What about that? Well, we want to say, and we, we said Father's Day a few years ago, we looked at the fact that Fathers are called more to th than to just be a provider. They're to be a protector, and they're to be one who provisions in other ways as well. And so we begin to see that there is this beautiful thing that goes beyond being too busy. Now, here's, write this down to the side. I've, Alex and I have talked about this a lot um, in youth ministry, student ministry. Um, I say, kids are like puppies. They like to play. And the younger they are, the more they like to play. I mean, that's just the way it is. Kids are like puppies. They enjoy that. Well, families have an element, even no matter how old you get, hopefully there's still a little bit of puppy left inside of you that likes to play. And so we, we recognize, well, where does this come from? How do we see this in Scripture? And this, these are just over, this is a very topical sermon this morning, not an exegetical expository. This is a very topical sectional sermon as we look at what the, the Scripture points to. Look at Ecclesiastes 8.15, and we, you'll notice that there's lots of Ecclesiastes and even Proverbs and Psalms here in, these, in this sermon today, because that's much of the wisdom lead, literature that helps us see how to live life. Look at what it says there in verse 15. And I commend joy, circle the word joy, and I commend joy, for man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and to drink, and circle these words, and be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. Now, work is not a bad thing. Work was before the fall. But work, work is a good thing. It's something that God has called us. We do recognize that after the fall, our work became harder. 
and it's under the bright and burning sun. There's no doubt about it. There's going to be long days in the hot sun is the idea of where you say, well, I don't work inside. I mean, I don't work outside. I work inside. But there's still there's elements to our, our necessity of living and, and working that are hard, just simply hard. But here he's saying, don't forget the joy of life. And the Ecclesiastes writer is saying, I say to you that there is a joy and that you can be joyful. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 17. As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches. Now, there's a lot to be said there. It's simply saying, hey, if you have a lot, be careful. You may not always have a lot. Paul is writing to Timothy, telling young Timothy, young pastor, how to deal with this issue of of earthly things in the church family and in, in his discipleship. He's saying, help the rich not to depend upon what they have because it may go away. Tell them not to depend on their riches. Look in the middle of the verse. It says, but on what? But on God who richly provides us with everything. And then look what it says, to enjoy. You see, God has given us these things in this life to enjoy them, some of the most simple pleasures, as we'll see here in just a moment. What kind of fun? What brings true fun to an awesome family? What kind of fun should we have? Ecclesiastes, again, says in verse, chapter 9, verse 9, it's, it, the picture is this, it begins with dads loving moms. I believe that this is the beginning of a healthy family, is when the God-ordained leader of the home leads in loving his wife. This is where joy comes in at its most fundamental level. This is where you see young children have confidence and relax because they see that mama and daddy are together. And this is a beautiful picture. Hang on, let me just preach. Let me just preach. (laughs) Let, just listen, just, just listen, just listen. Let's be careful here. Not, notice what it says in Ecclesiastes 9.9. 9. Enjoy life with your wife, whom you love, all the days of your, life, of your vain life that he has given you under the sun because that is your portion in life and in your toil at which you toil under the sun. So, Again, this issue of the work of life is going to come along. You need to remember that there is joy to experience there. And one of the key things that God has given you in this is your relationship to your mate. And specifically, as a man loves his wife, being the great foundation of the family is that marital relationship. Through that, even physically come children, and not to mention the emotional, spiritual, and all of the other ways in which the family is maintained. Look at Psalm 127, verse 3. We see another way that fun comes into the family. It continues with parents enjoying their children. Parents enjoying their children. Notice what it says. Let's read Psalm 127, verse 3, out loud together. It's right there on your outline. Look at verse 3. Let's read it out loud. It says, Behold, children are a gift of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Here is the picture. God has said that child is a gift. And if it, you know, when you give a gift, it's meant to be enjoyed, It's meant to be a blessing. You say, well, you don't know my kid. And I say, well, I understand. And I understand there's hardships there. I understand there's difficulties. Um, Most of you would say, no, pastor, you're right. I I, I see that. And And there's different ways in which different kids are different kinds of blessings. But God has said that we should enjoy our children. Now, notice the box that is there. And this is according to young children. So this is, this is the idea of the, the question was asked, what is your favorite top activity? What is your favorite activity with a family? So elementary kids were asked, what is your favorite activity? Do you know what number one was for young elementary children? Their number one joy was games. They wanted to play games. They wanted to play games at home. 
And, you know, Marcy smiles right now because she knows, I, you know, I want to go read or I want to go study or I want to go do something outside. I don't, I, I, I struggle to play games. Um, you know, so I've, I've been working on, there's a few games I like, like Catan. Some of you guys are working on Catan and a few other things. But, but games are something that kids love. Look at the second one here. You know what else kids, young children love to do? If you ask them, the second most popular thing is to go to a park. They want to go to a park. And I remember when our kids were little, they would go, park, park, park. I mean, you know, they're, they're just sitting in the back of the command center in the back of the car, and they would say, park, you know, or Chili's, Chili's, park, you know, whatever. But they, they want to go do something where they're running around, and they're, and they're doing those things, and they're, and they're with you. Look at the number three, and this would make sense here in this area, is they want to go to the beach. Kids love to go to the beach. We have this great big beach that some of you don't even know is a few miles east of here. Uh, you forgot that it's there. It's been so long since you've been here. You know, people come down here and they think, man, I wish I lived here. And we're like, yeah, you'd get over it. Um, you know, we don't go to the beach that much, but kids love to go to the beach. And how much does the beach cost other than parking? And there's some places where you can park for free. Um, not many, but a few places. It's, it's pretty cheap. But here's the interesting thing. These things, the number one thing that this is showing us is that your children, your young children, just want to be with you. They want to be with you. They want to have your undivided attention. That's what they really want. And notice this, how do kids spell love in this current day and time? Well, the way that they've always spelled it, T-I-M-E. That's how they spell love. They understand our time as that which is the filler of their heart. There's a number two. Awesome families encourage growth. Awesome, awesome families encourage growth. And I want you, when we talk about encouraging growth, if you're, if you're going to have an awesome family, it's a family that is going to encourage growth. Think garden. Fill that in. Think garden. How many of you have ever had either a flower or plant garden or a vegetable garden? You've ever had some type of garden at all? Lift your hand up real high, real high. Okay. Almost all middle-aged, but never younger. You know, it's like gardening's over, hardly any young people. I've had gardens. I love that. I grew up with two grandfathers that loved to garden. And up in North Carolina and Miami, um, we'd go out there and, and they would teach me about growing things. And I, I love that. When we got to France, we, we went into a house that had no lawn in it. And I enjoyed building that and putting lavender all over the place. And, and it was just this really beautiful thing that just in my spare time, I, I enjoyed doing that. This, this is... This is talking about the garden of the family. This is talking about the encouragement of growth. You see, with a garden, think about this. With a garden, you have to plant it. You have to water it. You have to pull the weeds out of it. You have to protect it from the weeds. You have to feed it. That means you fertilize it. You have to make sure that the, the nutrients are there. You have to prune it and trim it and cut it. You see, when you're talking about real encouragement of growth in the life of a family, there's, there's all of those kinds of things that play into not just your children. It's not just feed them physical food. It's so much more than that. And, and it's not just about the children. Listen to this. It's about the husband and the wife and their relationship as well as the whole family's relationship together as it is a growing unit. You see, you, and I want you to notice this. I, I, I love these pictures, and, I, and I, I would love to have a garden like that. Can you imagine having those kinds of, has anybody taken care of roses? Roses are kind of hard to take care of. I mean, you have to, you have to spray them uh, for, for fungus. You have to spray them for bugs. You have to um, fertilize them. You have to water them properly. The soil has to be right. But you know, it's an amazing thing about roses. Just go back to the roses there. It's an amazing thing about roses. When you take care of roses, man, they go boom. They, they bloom a lot. I've often said that every young man who's dating a young lady, he needs to go buy a rose bush and take care of it. 
Because the woman that you're dating is kind of like a rose bush. If you will take care of her, if you will come and you will take care of her needs and you will tenderly care for her and think through that, she will indeed, indeed bless you with many good things. But if you neglect her, rose bushes are interesting. You can neglect them and they rarely die. They just stop bearing flowers. They just become hard. And what's left? There's not a lot of flowers, but there's what? Thorns. I mean, there you go. You, you know, you want to take care of a rose bush so it's, it's worth all the thorns, right? I mean, you, you, you want to be, you, you want to see that because we're all thorny. It's not just our wives. We're, we, we're all thorny. But when we look at a garden, it requires that kind of care. It requires that kind of beauty. And what happens if we neglect it? Here's what happens. You cannot neglect encouraging growth without obvious consequences. Fill that in. You cannot neglect caring for a garden without obvious consequences. Now, I want you to look at these pictures. How many people want to live and look at that, right? Look at the next one there. What well, could be a beautiful little garden in a backyard in a crowded space isn't pretty at all. Do you think that garden's been neglected? Yeah, it's kind of been neglected. How about this one? Does anybody want to eat at that picnic table? <laughs> I, I mean, I, that's just not a very desirable picnic table. So is it A or is it B? Which one do you prefer? Is it two or is it one? You remember the optometrist? You know how they do that? They go back and forth. A, B, two, one, two, you know, one, two. And you're sitting there going, can I tell the difference? Can I tell the difference? I think the difference is pretty obvious. I mean, which one do you want to have lunch with with your family? Now, when you begin to think about your family as a garden, and you begin to think about, am I, am I growing my family? Is our family progressing together? As a unit, are we taking off in life? Or are we simply stagnating or being neglected in this? Now, Luke chapter 2, verse 52, gives us a little picture of how we grow. And this is specifically talking about Jesus as he was an adolescent. And look what it says there. And Jesus increased in wisdom, stature, and in favor with God and man. So here's a progression of these things, these four things that you see there. And, and I would just want you to notice this. Wisdom, right un underneath that, intellectual. He had intellectual growth as he grew. And that's, and that's what we do as humans. What about in stature? That's talking about physically. He's growing taller. He's maturing. Your, your, your children grow physically. Your family perhaps grows as you have more children. So there's this picture of that. But look at the next one. Favor with God. This is spiritual growth. All of these are important. And look at the next one, favor with who? With man. And that is social growth. And so we need to be growing intellectually, physically, spiritually, and socially. This is what the progression that we see in Jesus' life, this is the progression that we are called to recognize is needed. All of these together are important. You see, awesome families, fill this in, awesome families positively change. And what I mean by that is they change for the better. Awesome families grow. Awesome families progress. They positively change. Average families stay the same. Average families stay the same. They don't develop. Average families are boring in this regard. They simply, there's nothing new, that, there's no new activities, there's no new truths, there's no new realities that are being brought into their families. They just kind of get in a rut, and it may be the work thing, or it may be the busyness thing with all the extracurricular activities, and some of that is going okay, but all of the other areas are just stagnating. God calls us to grow spiritually. He calls us to grow intellectually. He calls us to grow in our disciplines, in our services, we're about to see. That all of this is to be moving down the field together in a joyful way. And awesome families 
do that. You see, there's five important things that you will learn from your family. Whether good or whether bad, you will learn these things. Number one, what to do with your feelings. You're going to learn what to do with your feelings largely from your family. And there's all kinds of venues on this where you can go into being run by your feelings. You can go to being um, the, the picture of hiding your feelings. There, there's all kinds of things that can happen here concerning our feelings. Feelings are a major part of our life. How we feel is important, but the intellect and the mind and the truth that God gives us has to all be brought together so that we properly interpret our feelings and we properly use our feelings and that our feelings are in subject to the truth. But there's many families that make no effort on that whatsoever. Their entire lives and, and each one as they, as they send out their children run in feelings, feelings, feelings. We live in a society that is very, very much driven by feelings instead of facts. We live in a society that does not understand the rational element that God has given us and the critical, logical thinking that God has called us to see in his word, in the way he works, and what he says is true. And so families are going to have you deal with, you, with your feelings and it may be good or it may be bad. Some of you were never taught by your family how to deal with your feelings. And so you were at the whim of how you felt. Or your, fam- your feelings were crushed. Your feelings were continually squelched. And as a result of that, there were things in your life that were very, very unfulfilling or very, very difficult as you didn't yet know how to deal with your families. Not only that, but your family will teach you, number two, how to handle conflict. Conflict is a reality in a fallen world. There will always be conflict around us. But how we deal with that conflict is very important. Some people deal with conflict in a very healthy way that brings about um, blessings and and joy and help, and other people deal with conflict in such a way that it only breeds more conflict. And so here we see that feelings, how do you handle conflict? How about this? Number three, how to handle loss. It is very, very important that children learn how to handle loss. And we live in a day and time when there's helicopter parents that are very concerned, hovering over their children all the time, not wanting them to feel loss. And now we have lawnmower parents. That's a, it's, it's a bit of a thing. Okay, so what do lawnmower parents do? Lawnmower parents go before their children mowing down all of the obstacles. And so we have a whole generation of young people that aren't taught very well in how to deal with obstacles and disappointments and loss and conflict because their parents always went and did everything for them. Now, I mean, it can be the very mundane things like your kid goes off to college and says, wow, my clothes stink, what do I do? And you're like, well, you mean you didn't learn that at home? You know, they call up and say, what detergent do we buy? You know, nothing, nothing wrong with that. What, what shop do we go to for this? What do we do about that? What do we, you know, where do we go for this? And, and they're still learning as they're coming along. But we need to be recognizing that it's not just about the small things like that, but it's about the big things that we have to be teaching how to handle loss. And look at number four. What values matter most? Your family is going to teach your child what values matter most. Does it have something to do with this? Is it, is it have to do with all of the individuality that goes through our electronic devices and all of the individual experience that has to do with a, a game or has to do with social media or has to do with all of the things from the world? You see, the world is injecting into our children and into our families at high rates the world's values. We have to recognize that God has called us to live by different values. What about this number five? Your family is going to teach you habits for life. That is the way it works. 
There are many things. Now, I know that you can develop new habits, but developing new habits is difficult. Much of the die is cast when a child moves out of the home, ever how eventual that may be. We, we, we see that habits for life are there. So these things from feelings, conflict, loss, values, habits, this is a, this is a massive opportunity, a glorious opportunity for us to have our family develop health and godliness and purity as God has designed or taking on all of the things as they come accidentally without purpose and simply coming out with an average family. Now, there are two ways to help people grow. When we're talking about encouraging growth, you and I, in our homes, we need to encourage growth. We need to encourage this like a garden. There are two ways to help people grow, especially as we think about parents and looking at their children. Number one is by example. That is the key way in which people see our lives, and it's what we do is what teaches them. Look at John 13, 14, and 15. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. Verse 15, for I have given you an example that you also should do just as I have done to you. Jesus is giving this as an example. Underline that, for I have given you an example. There are many things that we see in Jesus' life as an example of that which is right especially when he comes and he lays down his life for others. When he dies on the cross, he goes to the cross for us. He gives up himself that we might live. This is by example. He's showing us what is important. There's another way in which people grow. And it's the next bullet point there is by conversations. By conversations. No, no sermon on the family would be complete without Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 is perhaps the most poignant passage that we see on what we have been called by God to do with our families. Look at verse 6. It says, these words which I command you today shall be on your heart. Now look at verse 7. Underline this. You shall teach them. You see, this is, you teach them, you explain it. Diligently you teach them to your children. And you shall, look what it says there, talk of them. Underline that. Talk of them. This has to do with conversations. And by the way, it's not always just lectures. It's not always just lectures. I remember going up to Florida State to check out Florida State with my mom and dad. And dad was just talking, you know, he, I was a teenager and I'm going up to Florida State. And I remember dad just started, while we're driving along in the car, and he said, Andrew, let's talk about this issue. And he just started asking me questions. And by asking questions, he was just, it was very, very Hippocratic. It was very, very um, interactive. And he would lead in understanding what God says about lives, not through simply saying, okay, let me give you 30 minutes on this issue. Now, let me tell you, there were many times when I got 30 minutes on this issue. There is no doubt about that from Clark Coleman. Many, many times. And Bill Billingsley and others, Colvin Pinkerton, I mean, numerous others that would, wouldn't mind telling me what they thought. I needed that. But I also needed conversation, a natural dialogue and discourse. And that is what this is saying. This is so powerful. Notice what this verse says in verse 7. It says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them and circle it. When you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, circle lie down, and when you what? Rise. rise. Circle the word rise. You see, there's four things there. And basically, you know what this is saying right down there to blow? This is all the time. All the time we are to be discussing. Why? Because the world is discussing with your children all of these things. And that we are called to discuss the truths of God with them. Now, those are two ways to help people grow. What's the first one and what's the second one? The first one is what? To what? Example. By example. And the second one is by conversation. Now, there are two ways not to help people grow. And the first one is criticism. You see, there's very often in the life of a family, 
and perhaps in the heart of a parent, that we would think, well, if I criticize what they've done or criticize what they're doing, then they're going to see they're wrong. And by criticizing it, they'll see that this is not desirable. And I would say that is very foolish thinking. It is very ineffective. Criticizing and criticizing and criticizing your children will cause them to back away. It will cause them to give up. Instead, they need instruction. They need example in conversation. They need, they need help and encouragement, not constant criticism. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger. You see, that's, you provoke your children to anger when you, being strong over them, have the ability to continually squash their spirit and continually cause them to feel like they cannot do the right thing. Look what it says. But bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Below the word discipline, write training. That is speaking as much about forming behavior habits and that kind of thing. It's not simply talking about <laughs> corporal punishment or some other type of punishment. It is speaking of that in some ways, and we see that in the Scripture that at proper times, the child needs to recognize who is in charge and who is not. The younger that they are, there's different ways that that needs to happen. But here we see that a tongue lashing at every turn and constant criticism is what will cause your child to back away and not be able to go forward. Look at the next part here. Here's another very toxic one. In Galatians 6, 4, we see that this is a way not to help people, and it's by comparing. And this is not good for a boss to do with a coworker. This is not good for a husband to do with his wife. This is not good for a parent to do with a child. Don't turn the sheet over. There's some things you need to recognize here. Look at chapter 6 and verse 4 of Galatians, not Ephesians, but Galatians 6, 4 says, but let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. So you're not supposed to compare yourself to others, and by, by virtue of this, this picture is, it's between you and God, and it's between you and your own standing. And that is how the picture is, even with our children and their development. We are put in that place of helping them, not by saying, look at so-and-so. He did that a lot better than you. Comparison, comparison, comparison is a great way to have your wife shut down. It is a great way for you to destroy the intimacy that God has designed for you to have, not only with your wife, but with your whole family. It is a toxic way. Instead, by example, by conversation, and by joy. Let's go turn your page. Number three. We're going to move very fast. Number three, awesome families protect each other. Awesome families protect each other amidst the storms of life. Here's the reality. Notice this. Into every life, trouble, pain, and sorrow will most certainly fall. Awesome families, fill it in, are there for each other. They recognize that there's storms. They recognize that there's hardships. They recognize there's going to be pain. And instead of abandonment, there is company and help. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verses 9 through 10 says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their, for their toil. Look at verse 10. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls and has not another to lift him up. This is part of the thing of being in a pack. This is part of the thing of being in a clan. This is part of the thing of being in a family is that we are to lift up. When it, you know, there's going to become a time when something is going to happen and dad is going to struggle or mom is going to struggle or child is going to struggle. And here the picture is, is that we are there to do all that we can, <clears throat> all that we can to protect and help. Elementary age children say, this is how clear it is. Elementary age children, if you ask them, why do you love your family so much? The number one response is this, 
because they take care of me. They take care of me. Children know that. It's obvious to them. If you, if you ask them, why, why, why do you love our family so much? Well, because this is, I mean, they, they're just naturally aware. You see, some of the greatest character, fill this in, some of the greatest character can come from the greatest challenges. And that will bring about, those challenges bring about the growth that is necessary for life. Look at the next part. Some of the deepest love can come from the deepest pain. This is true in your relationship with God, and this is true in your relationship with family. This is true in your relationship with the people around you, is that some of the deepest pain, when God is strengthening and encouraging and building, we come to love at a greater way. Here are three great storms that every family, family member is going to hit. Number one, the storm of change. As you grow, you change. As life goes on, it changes. Work changes. Houses change. Health changes. There is change. And family is to be there to help through the changes. And let me tell you, when certain changes come, you need to get help. There are some changes that you are not designed to deal, deal with on your own. That's what the church family is to be here for. This is a broader context in which you can get the help that you need in many different, and there is no shame in asking for help. There is no shame when you are distraught in mind, when you are distraught in heart, when you are distraught in relationships, when you are distraught in whatever type of circumstance and pressure that a fallen world has brought to you, this is what the body of Christ is for. We see it in the family unit, but we also see it in the church family unit that we are called to get help. Now, there are sometimes even when, when counseling is needed, there's nothing wrong with that. All the time, we sit and talk with people. You know what? I go to counseling. I go to counseling with my mentors. I go to counseling with people that I need to share my struggles with. And I let them speak into my life. One of those counselors is my brother. It's one of the finest pastors that I know, New Life Baptist Church. When I have struggles and hardships in my life, I can go to him and I can say, I need your help. I want you to know that there are people that are around you that will be willing to listen to you if you will not be so prideful that you refuse to get help. The one who will not be helped is the one who will hurt. But when we come and we are helped in our pain, we find healing. I want to encourage you that there is the storm of change that will come to your life, and it's going to come to your children. There's not only that, but there's number two. There's the storm of harmful ideas. We live in a fallen world that rages against God. All of the sex that's on the internet, all of the illicit, just destroying of purity that God has designed, all of the foolishness of violence. One study shows that by the time a child is 18 years of age, he has seen 10,000 homicides on television or in the movies or in games. And now with games, it may be many, many more than that. Think about it. God says homicide is wrong. And we see it in violence. We see it in sexuality. We see it in all, there's all kinds of harmful ideas. Secular humanism that seeks to make you think that you're the center of the universe. That humanity is the center of the, human, of the universe. These are the ideas that are just flooding into our minds and our hearts through the modern media. My friends, that has to be met with the truth of Scripture. And that can happen in the family. There's another storm that's going to hit you, and it's the storm of rejection. This world rejects our hearts. This world, in some way, shape, or form, rejects us. And it may have to do with vocation. It may have to do with family. It may have to do with a spiritual issue. There's a, many, many different ways in which we are rejected. And you know what a family does when a family member is rejected? The family comes together and accepts. The family comes together, sits, and seeks to endure 
and seeks to teach that which is right in love and in grace. Well, I want you to see number four. Number four is that families serve God by serving others. Families serve God by serving others. You see, awesome families focus on others. Awesome families focus on others. The average family is self-centered. So look at that difference between those two. We don't just serve God. We serve God by serving others. And that's what awesome families do. You see, awesome families teach their children, fill it in, it's not about you. Awesome families teach their children, fill it in, God has made you for mission. He hasn't made you for your own joy and for your own pleasure alone. It's so much bigger than that. This is something our world does not understand. Look at the next one there. Awesome families teach their children, you are blessed to be a blessing. Don't miss that. All through your waking and walking and talking with Luca, Ivan, Danette, you can be teaching Luca, Luca, you've been given this, you've been given this talent. Luca, you've been given this thing. Be a blessing. It's the picture that our lives are meant. We don't walk into the room and think about, what does everybody think of me? What we are called to do is walk into the room and think about, who can I bless? Who can I encourage? This is what has to happen at the breakfast table, at the lunch table, at the dinner table, moms and dads, in the car, on the way to the school. As you are going and you're dropping your kids off, whatever school they go to, I want to encourage you to be teaching them to seek to be a blessing to the kids that are around them. Does your kid feel rejected? Teach him how to go after other rejected kids and accept them and love them. That will do more to cause the heart of your child to be healthy than just merely teaching him to be tough and that it doesn't matter. Teach him to be on the offense instead of the defense. Teach him to be a blessing instead of seeking to be blessed. Look at Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24. Let us consider how to stir one another to love in good works. You see, we are called to serve God by serving others. Love and good words. Look at Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 through 8. Here is the whole picture of the gospel, the true gospel of Christ. Verse 4, for each of you look not only to your own interests, that's what our world does. That's what our flesh wants to do. Just look at your own interests. Don't look merely there, but look at the next part there, underlined it, but also to the interests of others. And then look at verse 5. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Verse 6, who though he was in the form of God, did not account equality with God a thing to be held onto or grasped. Verse 7, he emptied himself by taking the form of a what? Circle the word servant. You see, we have been called to serve others. This is Jesus' example. And it's not only his example that was a nice example. This was the, the key by which we live. This is the gospel. If you want to be saved, if you want to be forgiven, you have to come to Jesus where he did just this. He laid down his life for people. So being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of, cross, of the death, even death on a cross. This is the gospel of Jesus. This is what we call you to believe in. And this is what we call you to live because that's what awesome families do. Look at Romans chapter 12 and verse 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another. Underline that outdo one another in showing honor. Now, I mean, there are so many ways that this can be played out, but you know, when your family thinks about other families that have a need and you say, hey, we're going by Publix and we're going to get some food and we're going to get it together, we're going to cook a meal, moms and dads, don't do that apart from your kids. Let your kids know what you're doing. 
talk to them about the fact that, hey, tonight when we go out of practice, we're not going straight home. We're going by Publix. We have to get some food. So-and-so had a car wreck, and their family is hurting right now, and they need help. And so you let your kid go with you. You talk about what you're doing. You show them that this is the way it goes. When I was a kid growing up, my grandmother, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother and grandfather Coleman, and my grandmother was always taking food to someone's house, taking soup. Whoever was sick, she would go take them something. In fact, the day that she died, she had cut the grass. That's pretty good. She made chicken noodle soup, and she took it to three people who were sick in their neighborhood and in their church. And then she went home and... She was found laying at the foot of the bed with her foot up on the dresser because she could detect that something was wrong and we, she had a massive stroke and died. Now, my friends, that is the way to go. She had always said, Lord, just take me. Just take me, Lord. When, when you're ready, just take me. She would always said that in her southern voice. But she, she was a servant. I, I want to encourage you. Be a servant. Teach others to serve. Teach your children to serve. You see, fill this in at the bottom. Awesome families practice selflessness, whereas average families, the average family practices selfishness. Two very different things. The average family practices selfishness. All right, flying along. I want you to see two awesome examples of families found in the New Testament. I I think this is so cool. Acts chapter 10 and verse 2. At Caesarea, there was a man named, what's his name? Circle his name. Circle it. For the last 2,000 years, Christians have read about this guy. This is so cool. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment of the Roman army. Verse 2, he and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. Isn't that beautiful? Think about the testimony of this man. Think about the awesome nature of who he was. Number one, they were united. It says he and all his family. They were united. Number two, they were devoted. It says they were devout. That's the, that's mean that the, the vote had been cast for them. They were devoted. Their will was in it. Number three, they were godly. Look what it says. They were God-fearing is what it says. Number four, they, they were generous They were sacrificial. They were selfless. Look what it says. He gave generously. See, this is part of his awesome family is that he was leading his family and giving generously. They could have kept that stuff and gone up to Milan on the weekend or gone over to France. I I would imagine, I don't know if they did that back in the Roman days, but I mean, he could have just spent it all on his family, but he didn't. He gave generously. And look at number five. They were disciplined. There were right out there to the side, spiritual disciplines in their life. And so look what it says there, to those in need. And he prayed to God regularly. Friends, that, that's an awesome family. I want you to see another example of an awesome family. And this one is from 1 Corinthians. In 1 Corinthians, we read about Stephanas. Look at this, Stephanas. In verse 15, it says, Now I urge you, brothers, you know that the household of Stephanas were the first converts in Achaia, and they and that they were devoted, excuse me, and that they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints. Verse 16, be subject to such as these and to every fellow worker and laborer. Keep on going. Look at verse 17. I rejoice at the coming of Stephanas and Fortunatus and Achaetas. Look at the next part, because they have made up for your absence, for they refresh my spirit as well as yours. Give recognition to such people. Underline that. Give recognition to such people. You see, this is noteworthy. This is praiseworthy. This is awesome. And why? Number one, they quickly embraced the Lord. They were the first converts in their city. 
Stephanos' family was the first converts in town. Number two, they devotedly served their church. And because they devotedly served their church, they were blessed. Well, what have we said this morning? We've said that, man, the whole picture is that God calls us to indeed be playful and recognize the joy of life. And not only the joy of life, but to grow as people. And number three, to protect one another. And number four, to serve as God serves. This is the picture of what it means to be an awesome family. I just want to ask you a question. What is your response? Awesome or average? You remember what I said? Average happens by accident. Average is not intentional. Awesome is always by intention and commitment. Husbands, wives, fathers, mothers, God calls you to look at what it takes to honor him in this and say, Lord, with your help, I will. See, here can be your commitment today, and I pray that you would make this commitment. With God's help, I'm going to make the rest of it the best of it. Maybe till now, it's not been so awesome. Maybe even up to this moment, it's not been so awesome. But you know, the great thing is, is that wherever you are in this process, even as a grandparent, that God can help you make the rest of it the best of it. Joshua 24, 15 says, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, underline this, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods of your ancestors are ser- served by beyond the Euphrates or as gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. And then look what it says. Read it out loud. But as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. I hope and pray that that is you and your commitment. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Two vital steps. Start by turning to Christ and receiving his grace and his salvation. It all begins in Christ, his grace and his salvation. And number two, to continue leading your home to serve the Lord. This is how families are awesome. Would you stand with me for prayer?